This presentation will focus on the basics of canopy management, why canopy management is important, and short and long-term canopy management strategies. The canopy of a grapevine serves many functions. It is necessary for the survival of the vine itself and can indirectly influence wine quality. Canopy management directly influences the microclimate or the environment immediately surrounding clusters and buds, such as temperature and humidity. Cluster exposure to sunlight as a result of intentional canopy management will alter cluster temperature, which can influence the rate of fruit maturation and can have profound impacts on the berry and juice composition. Even though canopy management has a large impact on vine health and fruit quality, it is still one of the more challenging areas in vineyard management. A lot of those difficulties have to do with how people view the interaction between the various parts of the vine. The canopy and fruit should really be considered as a single functional unit when considering canopy management, as the science and art behind the management aspect relate to the grower's ability to induce a degree of balance between energy production and consumption in the vine to their favor. The purpose of a vine canopy is to capture sunlight and turn that into energy for other aspects of vine growth, including the development of other vegetative parts such as new shoots, leaves, and roots, and the production of fruit. If the vine canopy is very efficient, it can produce a lot of energy. The only way the vine can expel that energy is by growing. In some cases, that growth is directed towards the fruit. In other cases, it is directed towards more vegetative growth. Controlling how much energy the vine produces and where that energy is diverted to is called energy balance. In addition to the leaves that can convert sunlight into usable energy for the vine, other parts of the vine can also be energy sources, and these include woody trunks, cordons, and root systems, which act as storage units that carry produced energy over from one season until the next. The parts of the vine that use the produced energy include any tissue that is rapidly growing, such as root tips, shoot tips, flowers, and clusters. These are often referred to as energy sinks. Over the course of a season, some parts of the vine may start as a sink and then become a source, or start as a source and then become a sink. Shoots, for example, start the season off entirely as a sink drawing on overwintered reserves from the vine's storage organs before the shoot and leaves are old enough to provide sufficient energy from photosynthesis. Once shoots become a sufficient size with numerous leaves, the shoot as a whole becomes a source of energy. The woody structure of a vine, such as trunks and cordons, are good examples of a part that starts as a source and ends as a sink. In the spring, the storage energy reserves in this woody structure provides resources for the actively growing shoots. However, in the fall, when the vine begins to shut down, nutrients and carbohydrates are recycled from shoots and stored back into the woody structure, thus converting it into an energy sink. There are other resources that can influence vine development and therefore could be considered as indirect sources and sinks in a growing vine. Water, nitrogen, and sunlight are all required for vine growth. When supplies are insufficient, the vine has a reduced capacity to build and store energy. When in surplus, energy is given to all sources to encourage growth. Heat stress, drought stress, diseases, and nutrient deficiencies can hinder the plant's ability to produce and store energy, and therefore reduce energy available to sinks. In the case of diseases, some pathogens redirect energy from the plant for their own development. Balancing energy sources and sinks in a grapevine is akin to balancing your checkbook. While one can account for energy sources and sinks, or income and expenses, the real question is, what should an appropriate balance number be? How much energy is needed just to maintain the vine vitality, and how much is needed to produce quality fruit? When given sufficient sunlight, water, nutrients, and initial springtime energy stores, the canopy, which is initially a net sink, will rapidly develop and eventually become a major source for the vine. However, an oversized canopy can become a problem for a viticulturist. Too much canopy early in the growing season can shade developing buds, thus reducing following year fruitfulness. 
Too much canopy early to mid-season can reduce fruit set on the current season's crop. Too much canopy mid to late season can shade developing fruit and slow down ripening or reduce the development of various fruit compounds that are desired in the winemaking process. Throughout the entire growing season, too much canopy can increase disease and pest pressure. In addition to challenges associated with overall canopy volume, high vigor of individual shoots, noted by rapid elongation of the shoot and inner nodes, can also cause issues with pruning and cold hardiness. One way to tell if shoots are growing too rapidly is to measure the internode length, which is the space between nodes on a shoot. For most production areas, two to four inches is the ideal internode length. Internodes less than two inches indicate that the vine is likely very stressed and not developing a good canopy. If they are longer than four inches, it means that there is too much energy and the canopy is growing too rapidly. Long internodes can be challenging for those who cane prune as it influences the following season's shoot spacing. In addition, when shoots are still growing in the fall, they may start to draw on storage reserves, hindering the vine's ability to survive the winter. Developing fruit is almost always an energy sink. Thus, fruit can be used to help balance the energy produced by the canopy. However, too much fruit, or too many sinks, may result in an overdraft of energy, and the vine won't be able to supply the necessary energy sources to ripen all of the fruit. In addition, the vine won't be able to partition nutrients for winter storage. If this happens too many seasons in a row, the vine will eventually collapse and die. If the vine has too little fruit, then the only way the vine can expel energy is through growing additional sinks in the form of new shoots and leaves. The main message in the energy balance concept is that vines will grow to the capacity of what is provided to them. When there is a large source of energy, the vine will expel energy through added growth. If there is insufficient energy, the vine will respond by a reduction in growth. A classic example of this is pictured here. Both of these vines are the same cultivar and the same age and growing within approximately half a mile of each other. The one on the left, however, has had excess water applied to it, and the one on the right is an unfortunate victim of a 10-year drought with no irrigation. Both have the same potential capacity, but have very different amounts of resources supplied to them that support the development of energy sources. Each vine grew to the capacity limited by their resources. How do energy sources in sink change over the growing season? From bud break until bloom, major sources are the woody tissue reserves, or energy stored in the cordons, trunk, and root system. These reserves are the only energy source for newly growing shoots, as these shoots are not old enough to provide adequate photosynthates to power their growth. If anything hinders the amount of stored nutrients coming from the woody reserves, shoots may not develop. In addition, if there are too few shoots developing relative to the energy available from reserves, those shoots will grow rapidly. From bloom until fruit set, the shoots will switch from being an energy sink to an energy source. Leaves are the dominant source of energy for the plant during this time period. During this time, the clusters are small energy sinks, and growing shoot tips are larger energy sinks. If the growing shoot tips are removed during this time, the energy is diverted to the clusters and vice versa. From lag phase of cluster development until verasion, or the onset of color change, mature leaves are still the dominant energy source. Fruit and growing shoot tips are still energy sinks. From periderm formation, or the browning of shoots, up to harvest, the mature leaves are the dominant energy source, and fruit are still the dominant energy sink. In addition, during this time, energy is starting to be diverted to woody storage organs and roots for overwintering. From harvest until leaf fall, the major energy sources are the remaining leaves. The energy sinks are the woody storage organs and roots. Understanding the concept of balance helps to place different canopy management techniques into context. Balance can be achieved through multiple means. Some canopy management principles are put into place at the time of vineyard establishment or shortly after. 
These semi-permanent means for managing the client's canopy are akin to having a base level of funds in the energy checkbook. Other practices need to be done on an annual basis and are fine-tuning adjustments, akin to repeated transfers into and out of the energy checkbook. A few of the more common semi-permanent determinants for canopy management are vine spacing, or the total number of vines per acre, canopy training methods, canopy division, and the use of divided trellising systems, dormant pruning style, and nutrient management and diversion. Vine spacing, or planting density, can be both a help and a hindrance in canopy management. A common myth that many new growers often succumb to is that high-density vineyards will result in vines competing with each other for available resources, and thus will grow smaller. However, this only works if resources are actually limited at the site, such as lack of water or shallow soils. In those situations, resources are so limited that the vine growth is slowed, and the high-density planting helps limit those resources further. Grapes can survive on very little, so competition only really happens when resources are extremely low. Generally, deep soils, high available water holding capacity, and high organic matter content will translate into high vigor locations, regardless of the number of vines planted on that acre. In this situation, the vines will only be competing for one resource that is relatively limited, sunlight. In a high vigor, high density planting situation, the vines will grow upright, searching for sun. However, if planting density is too low, or the vines cannot fill their supporting trellising system, production efficiency for the vineyard is lost. For maximum efficiency of land use, there should be a continuous canopy within a vine row, and not too much space that excess sunlight is wasted between rows. Note, however, that there should be sufficient between-row spacing to allow equipment to pass through the vineyard. After planting a vineyard, there are a few adjustments that can be made to planting density. These include interplanting vines should time prove that your original vine spacing was too sparse, or cordon extension should there be insufficient canopy growth to fill the trellis. Vine removal can also occur should the original planting density be too high. However, effort should be taken to determine planting density prior to vineyard establishment to avoid these costly adjustments. Overly dense planting in New World viticulture can be a problem, as most New World locations are not limited in resources, and because New World viticulturists often desire to create vineyards similar to those in the Old World, which are limited in resources either due to nutrient-poor soils, lack of water, or other legal restrictions. The concept of resource competition in grapevines is highlighted in this photo. Here, one can see a single grapevine competing with an untold number of other plants in a forest setting. Even with that competition, the vine is able to grow up to the height of a tree towards sunlight. This type of uncontrolled upward growth will occur if vines are planted in high density unless the vine's access to water and nutrients is severely restricted. In most New World viticulture production systems, the use of high density planting for vine vigor control only really works if you can control water and nutrient inputs. And if those are truly controllable, there are other, more affordable options than high density planting for vigor management, such as regulated deficit irrigation. The take home message? High density vineyards and new world production systems are best to be avoided. The training and trellising system for a vineyard is a means for canopy management that is selected early in the vineyard establishment process. In most new world systems, canopy training typically falls into one of two main categories with some additional combinations. The first major category is vertical shoot positioning. In this system, also called VSP, shoots are neatly tucked between catch wires, making for a very clean, upright canopy. This system is heavily promoted in cooler climates or locations with low sunlight. When done properly, it can also help expose the fruit zone, aiding in disease management. However, it is best suited for locations that have low canopy vigor, as VSP training on vigorous vines can exacerbate canopy density challenges. 
The other major form of canopy training is sprawl. Here, shoots are allowed to grow freely, creating a very disorganized looking canopy. However, this system maximizes sunlight capture while minimizing sunburn on the fruit. It is a particularly good system in areas where sunlight and heat are ample and areas with low disease pressure, as pesticide penetration into the fruit zone can be challenging. There are some systems that are the hybrid of these two. They often consist of vertically training one side of the canopy, typically the east side, while letting the west side sprawl, or they train up the middle one-third of the shoots, allowing both sides of the canopy to sprawl. These systems are typically referred to as modified VSP systems. In Washington, modified VSP systems are the most common in larger commercial operations, and strict VSP systems are more common in smaller operations. In addition to the basic forms of shoot training, there are also different ways to divide the canopy within the confines of a trellis system. Dividing a canopy is one way to increase the number of shoots per linear foot of row. Canopy division is a good way to manage overly vigorous vines and to capture more sunlight. Unfortunately, retrofitting a single canopy vineyard to a divided canopy can be expensive and can result in uneven ripening of the fruit in certain parts of the canopy. It can also create challenges in disease management and mechanization. However, if you have a smaller operation and are struggling with controlling vine vigor, you may want to consider canopy division. Pruning strategies can greatly influence a vine's source sink relationship and thus the canopy size. Pruning alters the amount of young tissue that will be drawing stored energy reserves in the spring. It will also influence how much fruit your vines will produce. In order to understand the principles of pruning strategies, one needs to understand the difference between spur and cane pruning. In spur pruning, only short segments of last year's growth are retained. Since it is coupled with a permanent cordon, shoot spacing is predetermined and easy to manage. Canopy vigor can be managed by either increasing or decreasing the number of buds left on each spur. The system is easily adapted for mechanization. It is an inappropriate pruning system for cool climate regions due to the retention of basal buds that develops during the spring and early summer and thus are more likely to contain tendrils rather than clusters. In cane pruning, longer sections of last year's growth are retained. This is beneficial in cooler climates that might suffer from low bud fruitfulness as it retains more buds that develop later in the season when it is warmer, thus favoring cluster development over tendrils. However, canes should be about two and a half feet or less due to the development of apical dominance, which can result in uneven bud break along the length of the cane. Maintaining shoot positioning and thus attaining proper canopy density can also be a challenge as shoot spacing is dictated by internode length which was set by last year's growth rate. Standard pruning fixes the total number of shoots per linear foot of canopy. In spur pruned vines, this refers to the total number of buds left on each spur, and each spur position is determined and renewed approximately every four inches on the cordon. In a cane pruned vine, canes are selected that have a similar spacing, a node approximately every four inches. With standard pruning, the ideal situation is to have six to eight shoots per linear foot. This is a lot harder to achieve in cane pruning, so often divided canopies are used in cane pruning scenarios where standard pruning is used on overly vigorous vines. That also highlights one of the major drawbacks for standard pruning. While it is easy to implement, it really doesn't account for vigor of the vine. Obviously, if a vine is vigorous, it can support more buds than a vine that is struggling. Balanced pruning is a pruning method that accounts for vine vigor. Buds are not retained on a per foot of row basis, but rather on a basis related to the amount of vegetative growth on the plant. In Vitus vinifera, the equation for balanced pruning is 20 plus 10, or 20 buds for the first pound of pruning weight and 10 additional buds for each additional pound of pruning weight. This is achieved by doing a quick standard pruning on a single vine, leaving longer spurs, 
weighing those cuttings, and then determining if more woody tissue and buds need to be removed or not. Balanced pruning will be site-specific because it is dependent on vine vigor. It also may take a few pruning cycles to truly determine the balance at a site. Vines can survive on very little. In some cases, however, other plant species can compete with vines for water and nutrients, and they are better at this competition than the vine. In these cases, interplanting a vineyard with other plants may help manage vine vigor, if only a little. The most common form of this type of nutrient diversion is the use of cover crops. Of course, this type of competition really only occurs in situations where water is evenly distributed in the vineyard. In a drip irrigation situation, inter-row cover crops will not be competing with vines for water. They are growing into different water zones. While cover crops only provide a low level of vigor management, they do have several other beneficial uses in the vineyard, such as adding nitrogen and organic matter to the soil, suppressing some weeds, providing refugia to beneficial insects, and aiding in soil erosion control. The main principle behind nutrient diversion is that a site has limited access to nutrients and water. Depending on how that access level is relative to what is required for vine growth, cover crops can aid in diminishing that supply without simultaneously competing for sunlight. The more well-known canopy management techniques are those that need to be done on an annual basis. In many cases, these annual adjustments are means to fine-tune the permanent adjustments discussed before. In other cases, these annual adjustments are necessary because permanent adjustments were never initially considered. The top five annual adjustments in canopy management include canopy hedging, shoot thinning, fruit zone leaf removal and summer lateral shoot removal, shoot positioning, crop load management, and irrigation management. In Washington, crop load management is not commonly considered a canopy management technique, even though it affects canopy development when done at specific times. Hedging is the act of removing the growing shoot tips to control the ultimate height of a vineyard. It is commonly done in VSP canopies and is typically done between fruit set and verasion. When actively growing shoot tips are removed, an energy sink is also removed and the apical dominance of the shoot is lost. This causes the shoot to temporarily stop growing, which is a loss of an energy sink. That energy is diverted to either the developing clusters or the development of summer lateral shoots, which are offshoots that can grow on the main shoot. The growth of lateral shoots creates a denser canopy with several new growing shoot points providing susceptible tissue for powdery mildew infection. This picture is an example of cutting the shoot tip or breaking apical dominance that results in summer lateral shoot growth. When a shoot tip is removed, seen here at the bottom of the picture, side shoots will develop. The most common mistake with hedging is inappropriate timing. Hedging late in the summer results in removal of too much shoot growth, which is also removal of nutrient reserves. It can overstimulate summer lateral shoot growth, creating a denser canopy, as previously described. The trick to hedging is to only remove the growing tip, not the top two feet of the canopy. The other very common mistake is that people use hedging as their only means of canopy control. This results in added labor costs from repeated vineyard passes to hedge vines multiple times a season. If this form of hedging is required, more often than not, it is an indication that the vine is out of balance. When done properly, there are benefits to hedging. For example, if only the very actively growing shoot tips are removed at bloom, the source-sink relationship can be switched to favor cluster development. In Oregon, Early hedging was shown to improve fruit set while simultaneously allowing for smaller berries. Shoot thinning is a very common vineyard practice, especially on spur pruned vines. Often, more buds will break relative to the number of buds that were intentionally left behind. This is because grapevines notoriously produce latent or hidden buds. 
if one's pruning strategy truly is balanced, not many latent buds will emerge. However, striking the perfect balance is nearly impossible. If too few buds are left relative to the amount of stored energy in the vine, the vine will divert this energy to the latent buds and they will break. The act of shoot removal is removing all of those latent or non-couch shoots and is typically executed early in the growing season when shoots easily break off the plant. Latent buds typically do not produce shoots that produce fruit, so their removal generally does not negatively impact yield. Fruit zone leaf removal is another annual technique that is done to fine-tune the vine canopy. It involves the removal of leaves from the fruit zone at various different times and to various different degrees of defoliation. Overall, fruit zone leaf removal helps improve sunlight and spray penetration into the fruit zone while improving air circulation. In the past, fruit zone leaf removal was done at the start of erasion, or fruit color change, as it was thought to enhance ripening. However, that late season removal is falling out of favor to more early stages of leaf removal. Leaf removal around bloom may reduce fruit set in cooler climates and on certain varieties, which can result in looser clusters and reduce botrytis bunch rot risk. However, a reduction in fruit set is not always the case in warmer climates. In addition, leaf removal at this time may also help reduce leafhopper populations by removing leafhopper eggs and nymphs, which are confined to lower leaves in the spring. For disease management, the optimal timing for fruit zone leaf removal is early in the growing season, between pre-bloom and pea-sized berries. For wine quality, the optimal timing is also early, well before verasion. Early leaf removal can help reduce vegetative flavors in red varieties and may also enhance anthocyanin or color development. As a note of caution, however, the timing of early season fruit zone leaf removal and its impact on grapes and climates such as those in eastern Washington are still being worked on, but the initial results look very favorable. Yield adjustment in viticulture is a common technique in areas where they have very little control over other aspects of vine growth, predominantly water. In this situation, a lot of fruit is left on the vine to intentionally control canopy growth. Once the canopy slows growth due to limited amounts of water, or in some cases due to lack of heat during a cool season, the excess fruit is removed. Typically, when controlling source-sink relationships, fruit needs to be removed before verasion. Irrigation is an interesting canopy management tool. It is an annual adjustment in that irrigation scheduling changes from year to year but it is also a permanent canopy management tool in that its use is determined by site selection and the mode of delivery is typically determined at the time of planting. For those who have the ability to control water delivery to the plant, irrigation is by far one of the most useful tools in the battle for canopy control. This graph is a depiction of what regulated deficit irrigation means. The blue background is a representation of the amount of available water to the plant from the soil. In the beginning of the year, vineyards are kept at high soil water content to promote early canopy development so that the shoots will quickly switch from being sinks to sources. After fruit set, the soil is allowed to dry down, providing mild stress to the vine, which helps control canopy growth. However, irrigation is still needed during this time due to high temperatures and plant demand but it is not used to completely replenish the soil moisture profile. By the time verasion comes, the soil is sufficiently dried down, but the soil moisture level is maintained above the permanent wilting point of the plant by using irrigation events. However, irrigation is never applied to the point where the entire soil moisture profile is refilled. This mild stress helps to slow overall vine growth, preparing it for winter cold acclimation. After harvest, and after the vine has shut down, the soil moisture content is replenished to provide root insulation over the winter and a water reserve for the vine in the following spring. This form of regulated deficit irrigation is most commonly practiced on red grape varieties because it aids in controlling berry size. In white grape varieties, where the skin to pulp ratios of the fruit are not as important, 
a less restrictive form of deficit irrigation is used, which allows for larger berry sizes, but still provides sufficient stress to help the vine shut down for the winter. The key to understanding the use of deficit irrigation in canopy management is that mild stress is best. This is not a situation where if a little is good, more is better. The practice of deficit irrigation should be used with caution by new growers until sufficient knowledge of the site, production standards, and irrigation strategies have been met through experience. Canopy management is one part art, one part science, and one part experience. Continued observation of the vineyard as it grows is the best form of continuous evolution of the effectiveness of canopy management strategies. There is no one single right way of managing a canopy, but there are plenty of wrong ways and an overgrown canopy can be costly. Understanding canopy management is understanding that a source sink relationship exists within the vine. Equally important is that a healthy canopy is absolutely necessary for a good quality crop. But healthy can mean many things. Overly healthy or vigorous is not good, just as overly stressed is not good. It is that sweet spot between healthy and mild stress that offers the best vine performance. Balanced canopies are attainable if the right combination of direct and indirect techniques is used. Thank you for your attention.